Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, um, my name is Dylan Robbins, and uh, uh, on behalf of the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies, I'd like to welcome you to the inaugural um, presentation talk uh, today of a series uh, called Charting the Portuguese Black Atlantic. I would like to start, though, by acknowledging that our center rests on indigenous Lenape homeland. And as we gather in this virtual space, we ask you to join us in acknowledging the Lenape community, elders both past and present, as well as future generations. Yeah. Um, Charting the Portuguese Black Atlantic is a series uh, that is uh, co-sponsored by the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies together with the Department of Spanish and Portuguese, um, as well as the Center for the Study of Africa and the African Diaspora, the Hemispheric Institute, and the King Juan Carlos Center um, at, uh, at, at New York University. Um, the series sets out to showcase uh, novel approaches to the fields of early modern uh, modern and contemporary Black studies in the uh, Portuguese-speaking circum-Atlantic. Uh, and it also uh, attempts to bring together more established as well as emergent voices uh, that work across a range of disciplines from history to art and literary studies in order to showcase the depth and richness of this emerging field of debates. Uh, together with uh, Jens Zanderman, the series has come together um, as precisely this kind of unique showcase uh, for important work uh, in, in, in the field. Um, today, uh, we will be hearing uh, the birth of a nation through film, the Mozambican Film Institute, uh, presented by Neis uh, Cordeiro Dias, um, who is a lecturer of Lusophone studies at the University of Leeds uh, in the United Kingdom. Um, before that, she was an assistant professor of Portuguese uh, at Spelman College, and she completed her PhD at the University of California in Los Angeles. She's currently finishing her monograph, her first one, uh, called Imagining Nationhood, Political Cinema in the Lusophone World, which focuses on how politics and film interact in Portuguese-speaking countries, in particular Portugal, Brazil, Mozambique, and Angola. Her next research project will focus on the representation of urban spaces in the 21st century uh, loose film context with a focus on how marginalized communities uh, represent themselves and claim their space in the city through art. The horn that you just heard uh, in the background was actually cued and meant to accentuate that uh, <laughs> the window is open and <laughs> we're broadcasting uh, live uh, from, from, from New York, but Ines has very generously uh, agreed to join us from several hours uh, difference in time zone uh, in the UK. Uh, so I just wanted to thank you uh, on behalf of the center and also on the co-organizer Jens Anderman uh, for joining us this afternoon, which for you is evening. Uh, and uh, to express as well how much we really look forward to hearing uh, more of your work, uh, in particular this, uh, this presentation, The Birth of a Nation Through Film, the Mozambican Film Institute. Yeah, thank you, Ines. Yeah. Hi Dylan, thank you so much uh, for the presentation, for the invitation. Thank you as well to Jens Anderman and to all the people involved uh, in, in organizing this uh, and to the Department of Spanish and Portuguese and the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies. It is really a pleasure to be here to speak about uh, a part of my uh, future book. Uh, and I think also one of my favorites because I, I have this strong connection to Mozambique. Um, so I'm now sharing my PowerPoint. Hopefully it is working. Um, and so I, uh, again, as I said, the title of my presentation is The Birth of a Nation Through Film, the Mozambican Film Institute. And here we have a photo, uh, a recent photo of the uh, National Film Institute uh, that changed names. Uh, here it was still uh, Instituto Nacional de Audiovisual e Cinema, but now it's changed again. I don't remember, but the acronym is INIC, um, with a poster for Kugoma, which is an amazing film festival that happens every year by the end of August in, in, uh, of um, Lusophone Cinema in Mozambique, that I really recommend if you can ever go. 
So I would like, I just have here some contextualization for, for people who are not quite familiar with the Mozambican liberation struggle um, against colonialism in Portugal. Let me just actually... Uh, so um, so uh, the first moment, the moment that marks uh, the Mozambican liberation st uh, struggle is the Moeda massacre that happened in June 16, 1960, when uh, a group of uh, Mozambicans from uh, the region of Moeda, uh, who were working in, in Tanzania, decided to come uh, to the city of Moeda to claim for independence and negotiate some kind of independence as most African countries were, uh, had already gained their uh, own independence. Uh, and so they were asked to come another day to meet the Portuguese authorities and they were met with guns and about 600 people who were unarmed died uh, in this massacre. And this is kind of the founding moment and it becomes a very important uh, national symbol that we will go back to when we talk about uh, Rui Moeda's film on the remembrance uh, of this massacre further on. Um, so the, the liberation struggle was led by Frelimo, which joined three previous other uh, organizations, and Frelimo was officially founded in Dar es Salaam on June 25th, 1962. It stands for Mozambican Liberation Front, and the actual liberation war began in September 1964. Uh, the, in 1961, we had a liberation struggle uh, beginning in Angola and in 62 in uh, Guinea-Bissau. Uh, and it lasted until 1974 with the Carnation Revolution in Portugal. And Mozambique became independent in June 25, 1975. And by the way, today, uh, in, in Angola, uh, we celebrate the independence of Angola, which, which was on November 11, 1975. So, um, so an important part um, of, of the liberation struggle, or um, it was cinema. Cinema had a, an important role. Um, so the liberation army starts, the first leader was Eduardo Mondlane, uh, who was uh, the first Mozambican to get a PhD. He got a PhD in the United States. He became a professor at Syracuse University in New York, where he established the, uh, the Center for African uh, Studies there. Uh, but later on, he decides to move to Tanzania to join the Liberation Army. And again, this idea of, of transnationalism is a very important uh, concept that I want to bring here. So, uh, and Frelimo is founded in Dar es Salaam, outside of the borders of Mozambique. Um, I bring here to, uh, three of the films that I think are quite emblematic and the most important of liberation cinema. The first one is The Struggle Continues by American uh, Robert Van Lee Rock, uh, uh, directed in 1971, and Behind the Lines by British filmmaker Margaret Dickinson from also 1971. I also include here Deixem-me ao menos subir as palmeiras, Let Me At Least Climb To The Palm Trees by Lopes Barbosa from 1972. Even though he was Portuguese and was not filming, uh, this is a, um, a fiction film uh, made in Maputo in 1972 uh, that talks about colonial oppression. But it is the first fiction that opens the possibility for a liberation struggle as it ends with the main character going north. Uh, it is implied that he is joining the Liberation Army to fight. So it is a film that in terms of it, should it be placed in colonial cinema or in liberation cinema is kind of um, dubious, but I wanted to include it here uh, also as an homage to, to the filmmaker who passed earlier uh, this year with COVID. Um, and I wanted to uh, pay particular attention and remind me in the end to give the link for this film because it's on YouTube. Since we are talking to in the United States to this film, The Struggle Continues by Robert Van Lierop. Again, this idea of transnationalism is something that is very important for my research and how um, um, uh, connections between different countries and people from different nationalities contributed to the birth, not only of Mozambican cinema, but also how what was happening in Mozambique was so influential in other countries, even though because Mozambique is a peripheral country, that influence is often uh, erased 
or forgotten. So the struggle continues. Uh, Robert Van Leerup was an African-American uh, diplomat from the United Nations and invited by um, Eduardo Mondlan and Janet Mondlan, who, who was an American and uh, Eduardo Mondlan's wife, they, they understand that it is important to bring the international community to support uh, the liberation struggle in Mozambique and to change uh, the international opinion that, uh, and, and to show that their struggle was legitimate. Portugal had a very strong propaganda machine uh, and it claimed that liberation uh, armies were influenced by foreign values, that they did not have the support of the local populations, that they were only terrorizing local communities and not doing anything for them. So to do these documentaries was an attempt to counter these discourses from Portugal and to show that not only Frelimo was fighting for liberation and independence, but they were also bringing education, healthcare, uh, agricultural knowledge to improve crops and, and feeding in, in these communities and how they had the support of the local populations. Uh, the Struggle Continues is a film that circulated a lot in the United States, especially among the civil rights movement. It became an example for civil rights movement, this idea that the struggle continues even after independence, that it is a constant struggle that never ends and we should always be aware of that. In fact, Eduardo Mondlane signed all his letters with this sentence, the struggle continues. And it became a motto for the civil rights movement. Um, I, I know it was a film that some of the older professors at Spelman valued and, and mentioned. And for instance, uh, African-American filmmaker Julie Dash mentions that when she saw in the 70s, the struggle continues, it was the film that inspired her that we could do different films beyond Hollywood, that there were other ways of filming the world, of, of, of showing images of the world and how that was inspirational uh, in her work. Uh, so again, uh, to see again how Mozambique was also important in some history of uh, United, US cinema. Um, so, uh, it is through these three films that um, Fra Limo and especially Samora Machel realized the importance of the image and its value and its strength in, in passing a message. Um, Eduardo Mondlan died uh, with a parcel bomb uh, before independence. So the person who follows him in Fra Limo is Samora Machel. We have here a photo of him in one of his famous speeches. Uh, and he um, and he becomes a leader. He was an extremely charismatic uh, political leader. I would say he is the most charismatic leader uh, I've ever seen, but I'm suspicious. Uh, and he would he was able to speak for seven hours to the crowds, and the crowds would stand listening to to him sometimes under rain. So he was also very aware of his charisma, of the power of his image, and he uses this. And he was always, he, he was kind of the main character of many of these films, especially of the newsreel Pusha Kanema. Um, and he was always, he always had a cameraman following him. So here I want to bring again the idea of nationhood. And first let me go back here and leave here somewhat in my shell. Um, so one of the major challenges uh, uh, in, Mozambique, in Mozambique after independence was how to build uh, this new nation, how to build unity, how to make everyone identify as Mozambican in a nation that was in, with borders that were created by Europeans uh, and with diverse cultures, ethnic groups, languages, etc. Um, and this idea, Frelimo used the word construir a nação, construção da nação, so building the nation, and this idea of building from, from almost from zero, construct, and national identity. So instead of recuperating something from the past, there was almost this idea of building from scratch that had began during the liberation struggle. Uh, and José Luís Cabasso, um, who, um, who, is, who was one of the ministers of the first government and who, was, who is also an important intellectual in Mozambique, uh, points that there were 
as major challenges, at first there were two different views of national identity. There was uh, the idea of proto-nationalism, the idea of a nation confined to its own region and ethno-linguistic community to reinforce traditional forms of power and knowledge and preserving the figure of the chief. So one that stood more to traditional uh, African systems that uh, were in place before uh, colonialism and during colonialism. And then there's uh, the Frelimo, um, view of national identity that uh, reinforced an idea of nation. It was a prescriptive project of a new identity built around a geographic territory that accepts the colonial borders. Its identity should be structured through the participation in a common task, the armed struggle, and by a common principle, independence. It replaces the personal power for a participative power represented by state entities, the liberation movement as the embryo of the state. Uh, and this is very interesting. I know I'm going to say a lot of contradictory, contradictory things uh, during this, this presentation, uh, uh, not because I'm contradicting myself or I am, but precisely because there were a lot of contradictions in this project, which I think are only normal when you're trying to build a nation and when you have such a gigantic task in front of you. One of its main contradictions is precisely how this idea of nation of Frelimu refused the figure of the chief, but at the same time, how Samora Machel had such an important uh, role as, as the central figure of the government that the people loved uh, and that was present in, in uh, many of the films as, again, this guiding line. He was kind of, as they call him, Upapa de Nesanda, the daddy of the nation. Uh, so to speak. So it is one of the interesting um, uh, contradictions, but it is also important to point out that when, when independence arrived, there were many popular assemblies. In fact, there were already popular assemblies before independence in the liberated areas, and there was a, a wish to educate the population for political participation, and film uh, should play an important role in this political education because it could reach, uh, 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 it was one of the, the media that could have a wider reach uh, of the population, more than cinema only radio. So when Mozambique becomes independent, radio is the number one cultural project of Frelimo's government, cinema is the number two uh, cultural project. Uh, the nation had over 90% uh, illiteracy rates so people could not read newspapers were not exactly an option that would reach most people and so cinema uh, and radio had this role and radio and cinema with the image uh, could also put for the first time Mozambicans in, on screen. Mozambicans were very excited to see themselves represented for the first time with their own voices. So there is this uh, uh, this idea of a new nation comes with the idea of a new identity, what it means to be Mozambican that goes beyond those previous ethnic identities. And again, uh, Samara was always talking against the concept of tribalism uh, versus this new Mozambican man. And at this time, we had a, a lot of different concepts of what a new man should be, but there, was, there should also be a, a new Mozambican man and so Ros Gray, uh, that has an amazing book on Mozambican cinema uh, that is here, and I really recommend if you want to know more. I think it's the best book ever written on Mozambican cinema so far. So, and she says, while Frelimo began as a front comprising diverse factions, 10 years of armed struggle and internal conflicts had produced the model of a new revolutionary subjectivity. This subjectivity was theorized through the figure of the new man, which defined a specifically Mozambican personality that was forged out of the experience of the armed struggle and involved the eradication of values, ways of life, and systems of belief that did not comply with Frelimo's political line. And again, this idea of Mozambican personality is central because every filmmaker that I talked about when I talked about the possibility of other film movements of the time that may have influenced them, like Argentinian Third Cinema or Brazilian Cinema Novo, they would always insist what we were doing was Mozambican for Mozambicans. 
Um, sorry. So um, going back here, <laughs> I'm going too fast. Sorry. So another central idea for the for for this new nation, Mozambique was an idea of a second birth, a radical rupture with the past, uh, opposing this to a possible idea of cultural rebirth, rebirth uh, that Amilcar Cabral opposed. And Amilcar Cabral was again very influential in, in, uh, for, for Frelimo. So instead of an idea of cultural rebirth or renaissance, we had an idea of cultural resistance that existed before independence that had existed for 500 years and this cultural resistance of the people that at a given moment could assume new shapes, political, economic, military, to fight um, foreign domination. And this is something advanced by José Luis Cavasso again. Um, so the armed struggle was seen as a cultural revolution uh, by many of the filmmakers. Camilo de Souza, for instance, was one of the people who insisted in calling the armed struggle and the moment after independence, all the building after independence that lasted for at least a decade as a cultural revolution. And I also like this idea of second birth because it connects directly to the name of the newsreel that came to kind of be the most iconic production of the Mozambican National, uh, National Film Institute, the Kusha Kanema, which is Shangana for the birth of cinema. So again, this new, new uh, second birth is again this idea of moving forward to a future, to building a new nation based on new values that do not necessarily reject the past one, but that are not nostalgic either about that. So it is very very uh, much looking to, to the future. And in this, and this idea of, again, of a future of modernity, of Frelimo as a social modern state, uh, cinema came also to represent that modernity. So the fact that the, uh, um, Frelimo's government and Samora invest so much money uh, in, in the building of a National Film Institute had precisely to do with this move towards putting Mozambique um, in the center of modernity. Uh, Mozambique became the first African country to be completely independent in terms of filmmaking, of film facilities. So before that, African filmmakers would have to come to Europe or somewhere, somewhere else after filming to develop, edit, uh, uh, synchronize sound, et cetera. And that they would usually do that in Europe. Uh, in Mozambique, they get the laboratories to do this. Only in black and white, there was no option to do this in color, but there were, there were still these facilities where people uh, like uh, uh, Haile Garima, for instance, finished some films and other important filmmakers, uh, African filmmakers came to use the facilities at a certain point. Um, so, um, Cinema then equates with this idea of modern nation and therefore culture is central to the concept of a new nation. And this comes in line with ideas of Emilcar Cabral. Um, and here I have a quote where Emilcar Cabral equates national liberation with culture. And here is, is this article and I quote, and he says, the value of culture as an element of resistance to foreign rule lies in the fact that in the ideological or idealistic context, it is the vigorous manifestation of the materialist and historical reality of the society already under domination or about to, to be dominated. And further on, he adds, thus one sees that if imperialist domination necessarily practices cultural oppression, national liberation is necessarily an act of culture. And here, I mean, there are two ideas as Marisa Mormon points out in intonation on that culture follows politics or as Benedict Anderson puts, uh, politics follows culture. And here I think we're more on this idea that politics follows culture, but it is very interesting how it were politicians themselves, many of them like Emil Carcabral, who are putting forward the, the centrality of culture in national liberation. Uh, and um, so I bring here now to, to continue talking about the role of culture and the idea of the new man, the Mozambican flag, because here to the left, you can see a book, uh, a gun and a hoe. And these represent the three main values of the nation. 
uh, the, the gun represents the liberation struggle that Mozambicans had to fight because they had no other way to achieve independence. The hoe represents work and work ethics, and the book represents education and culture. Uh, and in fact, the, the teacher will become kind of as an example of what the new man should be. It becomes an important figure uh, during this moment. And we will see this in, the, in a short clip I'll, I'll show. Um, and the, just to finish uh, or to wrap up a little bit on this idea of independence, I also want to bring Mbembe's idea of Afropolitanism, because in fact, we tend to imagine nations and countries has a, a, uni a, a united identity that never changed. But he points out how Africa is made of worlds in movement. Even in pre-colonial times, uh, there were many um, nomad groups, there were many migrations, many uh, in the Indian Ocean especially. So before even uh, European colonizers came, cultural contact, exchange, was already something that was very active in Africa. So we should, instead of thinking of nations with these fixed um, borders and identities, we should think of them as worlds in movement. Uh, and he advances a paradigm of itinerancy, mobility, and displacement. And again, if we think about the armed struggle and Eduardo Mondlane, how again, Frelimo was founded in Tanzania, in Dar es Salaam, how most of the armed struggles were held in the borders by coming and going, uh, how Mondlane himself had lived in the United States, married an American woman, and he established all these connections that were central to, uh, to uh, the Mozambican struggle. For instance, Julius Nyerere, the first president of Tanzania, was also fundamental. Um, and Bembe continues to, to advance that tra tradition does not exist and that we should think uh, in terms of a winter weaving of worlds. Um, other ideas that are important, I think, for, for this filmmaking, especially because I'm bringing the collaboration of Brazilians. So how am I talking about building a new nation and bringing Brazilians or uh, other nationalities to the centrality of this discussion of nation? Um, and uh, so internationalism was a way for Mozambique, I think, to claim a certain geopolitical position in the world that opposed precisely to the Portuguese fascist um, motto of proudly alone, uh, which was what, what uh, Port the Portuguese stands when the United Nations told Portugal that they had to decolonize. Salazar's answer was, we are proudly alone. And so uh, Mozambique by, wants to inscribe itself in this uh, international community. Uh, Mozambique became part of the non-aligned movement, for instance. Um, so it was something that was very important to create this national identity that was not a part of other, other countries. And, um, and again, playing also on the idea of transnationalism. And um, Marisa Mormon in her book, Intonations, talks about Angolinado or Angolanness about Angola as a, com uh, so she talks about this Angolan identity as a cosmopolitan practice that led into nation. Uh, and so who is Angolan? Angolan is a historically and cultural identity more than a geographic identity. And again, all these discussions, for instance, just came up on, the, on this year's Nobel, uh, no literature Nobel Prize winner, Abdul Razak Gurna, who many contested his Africanness because he lives outside of Africa, is actually he describes, uh, uh, according to Jesmund Kassinda, uh, a publish a Mozambican publisher, he points out how Gurna's work actually also depicts a lot of uh, the Swahili cultures in northern Mozambique. So. Uh, here we are again, how, how, how these borders that exist, but there are much more complex and this interweaving of worlds. Um, and just to finish, uh, bringing again Fano and Cabral, Fano uh, said that the colonization was meant to change the order of the world uh, and that the nation, uh, he defined, he and Cabral imagined the, the nation as the collective will of the people. So instead of this idea of nationalism as something negative, the nation as the collective will of the people and the nation has a space 
where there exists a right to difference. Uh, and in here, so Frelimo, and we see this in the films, one of the things that um, the films wanted to do again was create national identity, but without denying ethnic diversity. So the films would bring a lot of languages and songs uh, and, and customs of different ethnic groups. And the idea was that Mozambique knew itself. So mobile cinema had a, a central role in the developing uh, uh, of this concept. So um, filming teams would go to a village in somewhere in the country. They would film the village, their dances, their celebrations. And then they would also show uh, other villages in a screening that would happen at, at night. And then what they filmed would also travel the rest of the country. So there was, uh, as we, uh, Cabasso points out, there was a difference between identification and identity. So Fralimo accepted that people uh, had an identification with their own language and culture and ethnic group. What was contested was the idea of identity uh, because that was what could uh, have a possible divisive power. Um, and just to continue, uh, to think again about how nation and internationalism are much more connected than we might think. Manuel Ribeiro Sanchez in, in this article notes, and I quote, for Cabral and Fanon, inventive performative cultural practices should reframe tradition and redefine heritage through the liberation struggle and the common goals of the popular masses in search of an effective autonomy. Therefore, the nation state was considered to be a precondition for true liberation and national consciousness to be the precondition of international, internationalism. So you see how they are really tight knit uh, and, and they interplay together and they both have this important role in the building of uh, the Mozambican uh, new nation. And uh, Franz Fanon again pointing out that national consciousness, which is not nationalism, so making this distinction, is alone capable of giving us an international dimension. Um, and so here I'll, I'll just pass by, but Benedict Anderson, when he talks about imagined communities, talks more about the press, but he's here already pointing out Mozambique and the development of new media. Uh, and how that could have an important impact in the building of these new imagined communities. He, he points out how multilingual broadcasting can conjure up the imagined community to illiterates and populations with different mother tongues. Um, and uh, to enter the films, I have here another quote from Robert Stem and Alice Showat. So again, cinema, how can cinema create this idea of, of uh, uh, unity and community, uh, and they note the cinema's institutional re uh, ritual of gathering a community, spectators who share a region, a language, and culture, homologizes in a sense the symbolic gathering of the nation. Anderson's sense of the nation has horizontal comradeship, evokes the movie audience as a provisional nation forged by spectatorship. And uh, again, going to watch these, these movies at the movie theater for Mozambicans was something that was very, uh, it was very popular. It was a, a very important moment. Mozambican cinema was very popular and not only recouped the costs of production, but it also made a lot of profit. By the end of the, the so um, Moz, the National Film Institute, could collect 10% of the box office and use that 10% every year to run the Institute. And of those 10%, the money was so much that there would be money left that in the end of the year would be returned to the state. That was actually a, pro a problem because when, um, when the World Bank has to intervene in Mozambique, uh, the, the National Film Institute had no savings because in the end of the fiscal year, they had to return everything to uh, the, the government. So they didn't have much money to continue. And this is kind of one of the reasons that led to the end of the National Film Institute. Um, but again, people uh, would go to the cinema uh, sometimes just, uh, it, it was a very special uh, uh, experience to see themselves in screens, and especially with Kusha Kanema, 
uh, that I have here, and I'll, I'll, I'll go back to those slides, which was the newsreel. And uh, it had 10 minutes. People would pay their tickets to watch Kusha Kanema and leave. They didn't care about the foreign feature that would play after. So the big uh, thing that would bring people to the rooms was Kusha Kanema rather than the foreign film that might be shown. Um, so the National Film Institute was created on March 1976. Uh, it started by recruiting young students from high schools. Among them were Gabriel Mondlane, Cristalino Castigo, Ismael Vuvo, Miguel Chambula, Josué Chambel, etc. In a second moment, film aficionados with a strong activity in film clubs during the colonial regime join the National Film Institute, Camilo de Souza, Sol de Carvalho, João Funes Costa, Pedro Pimenta, etc. And the National Film Institute main objectives were to develop a cinema and a film aesthetic that represent the Mozambican people, uh, to create an archive of Mozambican images, and this idea of archive was also central, to politically educate the population and to show to Mozambicans the cultural diversity and the realities of the new country. So to create an archive is to create a memory, a history, a national identity is all about memory and history. Um, so the most, the, the most popular project, but not the only one at all, was uh, Kusha Kanema. Um, so Kusha Kanema um, uh, starts, has two different series. The idea came for, from Fernando Silva and Luis Carlos Patrakin. It was directed by Fernando Silva and João Fuxo Costa. Uh, and it had two series. The first one begins in 1979, but it was very irregular. And between 79 and 83, there were only 10 episodes in total. The second series begins in 1983 with the arrival of a team of Brazilian film professionals, such as Vera Zaverucha and Alberto Graça, and they are the ones who will put in order the, the a regular production of the Cusha Canema with a weekly 10 minute episode. Uh, here we have an image uh, taken from one of the Cusha Canemas of Samara Machel giving a speech. And as you see, the camera kind of films him on the side because he's directing himself to the crowd. So I think this is an important image to show him as someone talking to the people and not to the camera. Uh, so even though the, the people are not in this frame, but they are present there because that's where he is looking at. Uh, so, um, and this was, he was mostly filmed like this rather than being, being filmed frontal. He's always filmed talking to the crowds. Um, so Gabriel Mondlane, uh, a major uh, Mozambican filmmaker, notes that the Kusha Kanema related to the concept of national unity so that people felt involved, so that they felt they were part of the cultural mosaic, and also so that they could understand what was happening in the country. And the, this is the opening image of every Kusha Kanema. And as you see, you have a map from Mozambique. So again, there was this idea of reinforcing that this is a nation, uh, this is what Mozambique looks like, this is the map, but as you see, it's also divided in different provinces. So again, how these differences are still part of the same nation. Uh, and then the, the name would kind of go around uh, the introduction as we will see in the video that I will show now. And again, just to refresh memories, how I mentioned how the teacher uh, embodied this idea of the new, uh, the new man uh, that, that was bringing education to, to the country. So here it goes. <laughs> Não investiremos nos maus alunos. Realça sua excelência o presidente Samara Machel após visitas efetuadas às escolas nas cidades da Beira e Maputo, nesta segunda fase da ofensiva política e organizacional. Durante as visitas efetuadas, constataram-se várias anomalias, tais como a falta de embelezamento e conservação das escolas, o baixo grau de conhecimentos por parte dos alunos, o vestuário impróprio, a ausência das estruturas da organização da juventude moçambicana no seio dos alunos, entre outros. Olha 
Isso, por onde está aqui? O que é que eu posso dizer? Na Escola Comercial de Maputo, Sua Excelência o Presidente Samara Machel dialoga com os alunos e constata que um grande número destes possui notas baixíssimas nas disciplinas básicas. Onde está a garra, professor? Quatro. É em português. Cinco. É em português. Matemática. Quatro. Português. Cinco. Quatro. Português. Cinco. Matemática. Antônio. Raípe. És tu? Já. Já te vejo um. Se o professor é o mesmo, da mesma turma, como é que é possível haver um aluno de 15, por exemplo? Haver alunos de 12, não são muitos, mas há alunos de 12, para haver depois uma de 15. Com especial atenção foi analisado o problema do aproveitamento dos alunos e que está relacionado com três questões essenciais. A qualidade dos professores, o esforço dos próprios alunos e o meio familiar dos mesmos. So here, as you can see, uh, Samara Marshall presents himself in a, a very simple military garb. So again, this idea that the struggle continues after independence. So he's still fighting uh, for his country, but now that the struggle is just different than it was before independence. Uh, he also liked to portray himself as a man of the people who uh, has a hands-on approach. He goes to the schools, he identifies the problems, uh, this, he would do this everywhere. There's a film of Inciva where, uh, or, or, or Chile and Banner, for instance, where he goes to agricultural places or to factories doing the same type of intervention, pointing out what's wrong, asking people why they are not doing the right thing, etc. As you see too, it is very interesting that he's mostly filmed in the back, so it's not his face, but it is his message to the people who are listening to him. Uh, that kind of become the main focus of the camera. Uh, but at the same time, of course, he, he is the one who is guiding all the image. Uh, Kusha Kanema also included uh, not, not just uh, uh, these uh, moments of showing what's wrong with the country, of showing how the process of independence is happening. So there was, a, again, this idea we need to criticize and show what's wrong. It was not just about showing the good things. Uh, um, so this idea, again, of building the new man of political education um, and, um, and also here the role of, of the teacher, the woman who appears is his wife, Graça Machel, um, who is with him, but it, we don't even realize unless we know her face that she is Graça Machel, because again, it's as if this is all a big community, more horizontal, at least that's how they are representing uh, Samora. But again, there were other moments in, in the Kusha Kanema. It also included news, of course, music, and music was an important way of representing all these different cultures. There was all, uh, usually a musical moment, and sports was another important moment. It would usually uh, end with something related to sports, because sports are, again, another way like cinema, uniting people together to root for the same nation, for the same team, etc. And so now I see that time, uh, I'll try to finish um, uh, fast because I see time is running out. So there are two moments uh, when Brazil, so it was not just Brazilians that went to Mozambique. There were people from Italy, from the UK, from other African countries, from France. I mean, Jean Rouge, uh, Jean-Luc Godard were probably the most famous ones, but not the most important ones as Mozambicans like to point out that of course, uh, the, the, the protagonism has to be to, to Mozambicans, but probably because of the language, but also because of Rui Guerre, uh, they were probably, Brazil was probably the country where most people came from uh, to be part of the Mozambican Film Institute. So Rui Guerra uh, had met Gel Arraes, who is a Brazilian filmmaker, in France while studying uh, cinema at the IDEC. And uh, when Mozambique becomes independent, Brazil was under a military dictatorship 
and uh, Rui Guerra with these other people like Murilo Salles see the Mozambique as this opportunity to breathe politically, to participate in a project of building a new nation when their own nation was uh, in crumbles with the political, uh, with the military dictatorship. Rui Guerra was a Mozambican of Portuguese descent. Uh, and this, his trip, uh, uh, of him and Muriel Salles in 1977 was financed by the Miguel Arraes father, uh, who was the, the father of director Miguel Arraes, Miguel Arraes. Uh, and Miguel Arraes was a left wing businessman who, because of the military dictatorship in Brazil, he was Brazilian, was exiled in, Ar Al in Ar Argelia, Algiers, sorry. Um, and he was a strong supporter of Samora's government. And the first film equipment that Ruguerra brings was bought by, uh, by, um, by Arraes. Uh, so they both arrive in 1977. Later on in 1980, there's another group uh, formed by Vera Zaverucha, Alberto Grasso, Labi Mendonça, Antonio Luiz, among others. Uh, and they are the ones who come to uh, uh, create a, a production structure that is effective in the National Film Institute. They are the ones who create the second series of the Kushakanemas, editing one episode of 10 minutes per week. With them comes Licinio Azevedo, who is still, who, who stayed in, in, in Mozambique until nowadays, and he's now an important Mozambican filmmaker, uh, I think we could say. And um, Vera Zaverucha is, she was the president of Embra Film in Brazil, and she has worked a lot with, uh, uh, she, she is one of the people who wrote the audiovisual law in Brazil. So maybe this is, but I also like to think if she wrote the audiovisual law in Brazil, how in, in many ways, Mozambique influenced and changed her life and her view of cinema. So in some ways impacted Brazil's audiovisual law, she notices that Mozambique gave her that uh, notion of cinema as, uh, as a group of films, as the, the, the group uh, of what is important is not a singular film, a singular filmmaker. What is important is the entire work, what you're doing with that and what you can do with cinema. Uh, so uh, what you can do with the image and how do you unify the country with information? And she says that this is what brings her to work in institutions in Brazil like Embra Filme and to think about audiovisual law and how this is so much more important than a major film by a major director. Um, and so from these, they came first to teach a three month class um, with, uh, so Alberto Grasso worked on directing, Vera Zaverucha on production, Antonio Luiz on camera, Labi Mendonça on sound. And the idea was again to offer training to Mozambicans who before independence did not have access to this type of training. So uh, this is why this was so important, this international collaboration, because the Portuguese did not allow, and not only in cinema, but in, in any other area, in, in Mozambique, uh, foreigners came to help Mozambique build itself since Portugal didn't leave uh, structures or, tra or trained people uh, to, part to, to organize the country. Uh, they also made a textbook, for instance, on how to make film. Um, and again, I, I spoke, I interviewed Vera Zaverucci and Alberto Grasso, and they again point out how this changed their notion of what it is to make film. And instead of wanting to make their own films, they became more interested in this power of film to educate, a film to unify a nation, to, to create a, na a national identity, to create culture, etc. So I had here, but I think I don't have much time to talk. The, the first film uh, made in Mozambique is made by Murilo Salles, who is Brazilian. He comes with these brand new cameras, but there's barely any film actual film to use. So what he will do is make a film using archive images from the colonial period. And he directs Esther São as Armas, these are the weapons from 1978. This is an image from the end of the film. So it is interesting because you see it's like it's a child who is writing uh, and is learning to write. So again, this idea of education to build the new man um, is present. 
Uh, the film won the Silver Dove at the Leipzig Film Festival. One of the 500, it was considered one of the 500 most important documentaries in history. It premiered in Maputo in 1980 at the Bullfight Arena during three days in continuous sessions that began at 6 p.m. So the film would play until, until there was no one left. They would wait until everyone would leave. With 320,000 spectators, it was the big, biggest box office success in Mozambican cinema. And now I go to Rui Guerra, uh, who brought all these Brazilians to, uh, to Mozambique. He was born in Mozambique in 1931 studied film in Paris, as I mentioned. He is also one of the leading filmmakers of Brazilian Cinema Novo. And after 25 years away from Mozambique, he returns in 1977, sorry, to collaborate with the National Film Institute. And the films are the most important film that I, he directs is Moeda, Memoria uh, e Massacre in 1979, that also becomes kind of an example for Mozambican filmmakers who wanted to do fiction. Uh, and who aspired to do something more than documentaries. Um, so the film, uh, so from June 1976 and during two decades, there was a yearly popular theatrical representation of the massacre of Mueda held at the main plaza of the city where the massacre also took place. So Rui Guerra says the following, would you, so in an interview, sorry, someone asks Rui Guerra, would you agree that your film isn't really about the massacre, but its remembrance? Rui Guerra agrees and adds, it's about how a people remembering a massacre in which family and friends participated and died, about how they can deal with it and with the joy. Um, so again, it is a film about the, the founding moment of uh, national liberation. It's kind of the founding moment of the nation. But at the time when, when the Moeda massacre happened, it were, it were the Maconde who were claiming for the independence of the Maconde Plateau. So there were here some issues that Frelimo had uh, to control the narrative uh, because there was again an, an, a fear of a national division. So it, it, the idea that they were Maconde had to be switched, that they were Mozambican. And this led uh, to a shock with Rigueja. Uh, they wanted to take a scene of the film and Rui Guerra did not agree. So Raimundo Pachino Apa, Cabo Delgado's governor, when the massacre took place, tells the camera his version of the story. Pachino Apa wears a FPLM uniform from Forças Populares para a Libertação de Moçambique, so not Frelimo. However, when the film was filmed, Frelimo did not yet have an official position regarding the massacre. The fact that he was wearing a uniform implied that his declarations were official, even though the Central Committee had not yet taken a position. Rui Guerra allowed the, uh, the National Film Institute to change the film, but abandoned its direction. Um, and here is one of the opening scenes of the film. So here there's people who defend uh, Rui Guerra, that he didn't have freedom, that he was censored. But what I think happened here was precisely a shock of two different concepts and notions of cinema. Rui Guerra had a, a concept that was closer to author cinema or what uh, Fernando Solanas and Octavio Gatino called, called second cinema, uh, where he wanted to have full authority over his film, whereas Frelimo was more preoccupied with this concept that Vera Zaverucha mentions of uh, filming for the nation to educate the nation, uh, of thinking about the group rather than just focusing on, on, a on, on a specific work of a specific author. So this was almost a collective cinema. I mean, the films had their own filmmakers, but there was this idea that this was a collective project where the figure of the auteur should be subsumed to this national project of the National Film Institute. Um, so, um, just thank you, and just to, to quickly um, uh, sum up, uh, so again, I, I want to bring how important it was this to, to the building of the nation, how film uh, became central for Mozambicans to see themselves represented, but also to pass this idea of unity. Of course, it was very, there were contradictions because there was, um, uh, kind of a, a guidelines that the filmmakers should follow. 
many of the filmmakers say they never felt censored, uh, but they were also, they also agreed with what the government expected of them. Um, and again, it was also a moment where a lot of international people came to participate and how Mozambique was trying to inscribe themselves as a modern country, a country that is important in geopolitical terms. And that means being connected to, to other countries. And that means that the nation is connected to other nations in this idea of transnational solidarity that was also so important to, to this project. So thank you. I hope I didn't go too much beyond time. Thanks, Ines, no, for a wonderful presentation. I was really intrigued by uh, all the different archival material that you had, and especially the the, the brief segment of the, the newsreel that you shared with us. Um, I thought I might open the questions with a question myself uh, in order to kind of maybe, you know, something that occurred to me as I was seeing this 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 really interesting archival material and then also like the the really expansive geographies that you mentioned I mean whether it's uh you know coming to Mozambique you'd mentioned you know Jean Rouge uh and then also the use of like some workshops in order to teach young Mozambican filmmakers certain techniques um and then also the the idea of this kind of cinematic independence is marking a really important uh juncture in mozambican nationalism or you know national independence and in the the echo that i was sensing is is the cuban case which you know is a similar kind of trajectory with many of uh, uh similarly arranged institutions and concerns whether it's like the establishment of the film institute is one of the first cultural initiatives of the revolutionary uh government in 1959 or even the use of newsreels and documentary, and especially about trying to expand, you know, um, you know, movie going to audiences well beyond, you know, an urban middle or working class. So um, I was wondering, is there a Cuban connection here? <laughs> and well, I don't think that there needs to be one, but there just seems to be like, there seems to be like some echoes of a similar kind. No, that's, that's an amazing question, because I think that's a major thing that, that really interests me. So, that's a question I ask every filmmaker because obviously the, the way the Ikai was, was produced, we see so many reflex, uh, reflections of that in the National Film Institute. But what everyone tells me is basically, I mean, the, the, the answer is basically no, because I think Mozambicans, but also Vereza Verucha in the interview I made her said the same thing. No, it was something made in Mozambique. I mean, we were doing the same thing as them, but we were not paying attention to what they were doing. That's not what we were followed because we didn't know uh, or we weren't aware, but it was the spirit of the time is very often what they say. So for instance, I asked them, did you read the uh, third cinema manifesto? Because that's what they're doing, a real cinema. Oh, no, no, but it's what we were doing. When, when I explained what Solanas and Gatinos describe, they also say that that's what they're doing. There were collaborations with the ICAI. There were Mozambicans going to the ICAI to study film. I think Gabriel Mondlane went there. Vera Zaverucha later on went there. More people went. There were Cubans who came. Santiago Alvarez came. And there's an entire Cushacanema episode filmed by him that I just saw on, on my second time that I went to Mozambique. So I still need to, to pay attention to really, I, I have it on my uh, personal archives now to kind of look at it, I think. Uh, yeah, so I, but um, so, so they were there and they came and of course these ideas were there. But I also find so interesting how both Brazilians and Mozambicans are very eager to reinforce, no, what we were doing was our own thing, it was, something made by Mozambicans for Mozambicans. That was the spirit of the time. Of course, there are similarities. Of course, they came here. We watched Cuban films, but that's only it. So, so that's why it's such an interesting question because it is a question that I've asked many of them. So, so I think there was really this importance for Mozambican cinema to assert its independence from other cinemas, including Brazilian cinema novel. Francisco Pires, who uh, uh, says, uh, I have two related questions about the influence of politics on the Mozambican cinematographic project. To what extent did the collective project of constructing a new, ident a new nation slash identity become personal, tried to a charismatic leader like Samora Michel? It's very hard to see Michel's mannerisms and not to think about Fidel Castro, <laughs> again, the Cuban connections, did the increasing 
personalism prevent the further development of Mozambique's transnational uh, connections? Um, then Fabio Andrade asks, and I'm trying to um, summarize, so he um, uh, wants to hear more about the role played by Rouge's Atelier Varan as an educational project in Mozambique um, in the mid 70s. Do you know if Rui Guerra was involved and what's the current state of film production in Mozambique? Um, then there's uh, from Rafael Cesar, um, again, thanking you for the wonderful talk. You mentioned that Mozambique became the first African country um, to become completely independent in filmmaking. I was wondering how this impacted the kind genres and ideologies uh, of film produced in Mozambique in relation to the production from other Lusophone African countries, uh, for example, Angola, uh, one of the most important films, Sambi Zanga, Thanks, Rafael, co-written and directed by Guadeloupean French director, the great Sarah Maldoror, discussed and conceived internationally in the European circuit. How does the fact that Mozambicans produced their films locally change the kind of films they made in relation to other African countries or even the idea of nation? Conversely, perhaps you could also comment on how the presence of international filmmakers and instructors, particularly Brazilians, impacted ideas of nation in Mozambican film. Very long question. And there's a very short one from Sibylla Fisher, who uh, would, wanted to hear if, if Sara Gomez had any impact on, um, That's, on I'll, in, I never heard about her impact, but you never know, because it's so many things. I never heard of it, but it, it might be. I mean, I, that's something I will investigate. Uh, so going well, these are <laughs> great questions. Uh, so let's go here to... Um, uh, uh, to Francisco Pires' uh, question, so let me, because I forgot, so uh, tied to a credit, so the, 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 the figure of Samora Machel. So he was also a choice that using Samora Machel, because Samora Machel was this very charismatic figure that would make people identify him with the nation. It was kind of a guiding line that would put everything together. So if people would see the image of Samora, they would recognize the leader and the nation. Again, as I mentioned, many of these films were also shown throughout the country in, in smaller villages where most of the people did not speak Portuguese. So they could not understand what he was saying. And the films would be rather than interpreted as we understand them now, or translated, uh, the, the, the local interpreter would explain the films to the population uh, in a way that they could understand. And so Samora was again this image that if people kept seeing, it was a thing that they would see repeatedly uh, that they identified with. Um, and uh, and not think about Fidel Castro. I mean, of course, we see a lot of, uh, I mean, again, these things are connected and it, it, it's impossible. I also see all these connections, but it's just interesting because at the same time, I mean, I, I know Samora did not have some reserves uh, regarding um, Che Guevara. He received in, but not in Maputo and not officially because of the way Che Guevara uh, spoke about Africans in the liberation struggle. So Samoro again was very, very focused on defending Mozambique before um, anything. Um, and this idea of a, so let me, so to what extent do, um, did this increased personalism uh, prevent the further development of Mozambique's transnational connections? Uh, I don't think so uh, because I mean, those things can, can coexist. And again, even foreign people who see Samora, I, I, I was enthralled by him. I know Margarida Cardoso who did Kusha Kanema decided, because Kusha Kanema was not just about Samora, but she put her Kusha Kanema documentary is, she told me is about Samora in the Kusha Kanemas. Vera Zaverucha talks about his, his charisma. So it is a figure that is kind of so interesting that I, I think it actually attracts all these these uh, these transnational connections, and he he was again someone who was interventive, who, who defended Mozambique. Um, I mean, in many ways, who knows if this is why he 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 died? He also made a lot of enemies uh, because he didn't make any concessions. He didn't make concessions to the Soviet Union, to China, uh, to anyone. So. Um, 
so yeah so i, I should read again the, i hope i'm not sure if it's I'm a very talking. interesting idea isn't there in the in the film by by margarita cardoso about samora in a sense also being a co-director of many of these episodes where he's the the teacher figure or where he so the, the mise-en-scene and i think it's paulo pimentel who said i i didn't have to do anything uh, in terms of editing because Samora had already done it all, uh, which is interesting because the very um, use of cinema already um, is predicated on a knowledge of what you can do with cinema as, as a sort of national pedagogical project, isn't it? Exactly, exactly. And again, because the National Film Institute was not just the Kushakanemas. You had larger documentaries that would choose one issue and focus on it. For instance, Shilembeni set on, on Samora's uh, birth city, but it is about uh, the, the agricultural struggles of the people and how to change from a single crop and what, what the Portuguese administration had done and how to correct that. Or you have another one, Ibu, the blood, uh, the Blood of Silence, where they film a, a former prison uh, for political, Mozambican political prisoners, and they would focus on that. So it was not just definitely about Samora Machel at all. It's just, I think, because precisely he's so charismatic, the people that talk about the National Film Institute hand up like I just did to focus on Samora, because the more you look at him and the more you study, it is, um, a fascinating political figure. I would say for me, it's the most fascinating political figure. I was just listening to my interview with Vera Zaverucho, who said he's even more fascinating than Fidel Castro, or as fascinating as Fidel Castro. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, it, it is, he, he becomes this almost hypnotic, and he knew that. And again, Vera Zaverucho says this too. He would say, you put the camera here, you put the camera here. I, I mean, probably he is the one who is being chosen to have the camera filming him talking to the nation instead of that traditional politician who speaks facing to the camera he is talking to the people he wants to be seen as someone who speaks to the people he's so aware of this that he's the one commanding the cameras murilo salas when he arrives to mozambique because at the time he was the better trained person he immediately takes him out of the national film institute and puts him uh, filming, uh, being his main cameraman, that he would always have a cameraman following him. So it is something that is, it's maybe a future work, I don't know, an article or something on, on Samora and self-fashioning, because he did the same with photography. There's this photographer, Kok Nam, who has a whole book on, on with photos from Samora that are, again, very interesting. Um, so, so, yeah. Um, should I move on to Fabio? So Fabio is asking, what was the role? Uh, well, the Atelier Vahan, now I'm not sure if they had a role. I'm not sure means I don't know. Uh, Jean Rouge, so Jean Rouge came uh, to, the, to Mozambique. Uh, I know again, when I bring Godard and, and Rouge, and I think they're right, because Godard and Rouge are so famous. Uh, usually people always ask, oh, what what was their role? It was actually minor, and Mozambicans insist to emphasize emphasize that it was a minor role. Uh, Rush actually did not teach cinema at the National Film Institute, according to Gabriel Mondlane. His classes were taught at um, at the University Eduardo Mondlane. So there was already kind of a rupture there, and he ended up teaching these classes. Even though Gabriel Mondlane is, said he was a great experience and he learned a lot uh, with Rouge, most of his films are lost. And in one of the Kugoma Film Festival, no, not in the Kugoma, because the Kugoma Film Festival is also organized with a seminar uh, by the Museum of Cinema, everything done by Diana Manisa, who, who is here today and who is like, <laughs> one of the most important people doing things for film in Mozambique today. Uh, and there was Philippe Constantini who brought a, a film by Rouge and we had the opportunity to watch it. It was the first time I actually, I thought all these films were completely lost, but the image was quite bad and the sound it was almost impossible to understand, just a little bit, and they were spoken not in Portuguese. There were some people who, I forgot the language, who 
could understand a few things because they could speak the language, but still it was very, um, very damaged, unfortunately. Uh, and and um, Godard goes there to do a TV project, but again, their, their idea of, of auteur cinema, I think, came into shock a lot with Mozambican filmmakers. Uh, and so Mozambican filmmakers were not very happy with Godard and Rouge may, precisely because they wanted a protagonism, a certain protagonism that I think the National Film Institute did, the National Film Institute wanted to be the protagonist. And I think, I mean, they have the right to be the protagonists of their own history. That's what Mozambican cinema is about. Um, so again, it is a very contested figure and they became kind of the, these internationally, the main focus, but they were not the most important people at all. Brazilians had a much more important role. Um, Santiago Alvarez participated more because he did direct a Cusha Um, So, so yeah. Uh, and what is the current state of film production in Mozambique? I mean, I, one of the things that I'm all, always amazed with Mozambique is with so many resources, especially in Maputo, how lively the culture is there. And now I'm not just talking about film, I'm talking about art, street art. People are doing a, a lot with ve very little. Uh, there's the Kugoma Film Festival. There used to be Doc Kanema, now there's Kugoma. Uh, that's Diana Menisa. Uh, created with other people and, and organized. And I, I think now is being created by, uh, by a younger uh, Mozambican, um, not filmmaker, but I know he's connected, Mashaye, I forgot his name, sorry, because it's a hard name, it's a Shangan name. So, um, but I, I do think again, there, is, there isn't much money, but people are doing very original things, especially with shorts. And in Kugoma, you can see short films that students are making that sometimes don't have the best quality, but that I do think, again, and I like to think as Vera Zaverucha said, of cinema as a process more than focusing on one film and how great this author is. I'm more interested in, in how, especially young people through these short films are thinking about cinema in their country and about portraying themselves. And, and so there isn't much money, there isn't much funding. Mozambique is going through a huge financial crisis, uh, but still with so little, I think they do so much. So I really advise people to go there and visit and see in person what they're doing. Yeah, so let me, so here, uh, Rafael Cesar is asking, uh, so uh, Mozambique became the first African, it was the first African country to be, to have like the, the whole, like for developing editing, it was the first one, um, not Lusophone. There were films who had like, I, I think Burkina Faso was pretty advanced, but Mozambique was the first one to, to be completely independent in terms of studios. And I think that's important to, to emphasize. Um, how this impacted the kind genres and the ideologies of film produced in Mozambique. So again, there was this need to film for Mozambicans and most Mozambicans because of colonialism did not have access to cinema. In the cities they would, they would have access to go watch films uh, the, the cinemas were segregated, but they did. But in, in small villages, many people had never seen a film. So they had to think of a language that would be easy to understand to people. So there was a slow pace um, um, where I had that pointed out somewhere. So the idea was slow pace. There was a voiceover that explained things. However, it was not an authoritative voice like that of colonial films, there would be interviews, people would talk to the camera. There was this idea, also the plans would be very simple. Uh, for instance, someone always tells me, uh, Camilo de Souza told me this story, that they filmed someone crossing a bridge and they cut when the person is in half of the bridge and then, then go to other side and feel them arriving. And Mozambicans thought, well, he just came back because there was not, so you had to think of an, an entirely new language to, to, so that people would understand. So there was a very pedagogical concern in here. Um, and, and again, that was the main purpose. And this is why also Frey Limu really insisted on making documentaries because the idea again was to represent Mozambicans 
there were three fiction films. I mean, Rui Guerra's film is between fiction and, and documentary because it's a play that he films. Uh, and then there's O Vento Sopra do Norte uh, by José Cardoso, which is completely fiction. And there's The Time of the Leopards, uh, which was made by a uh, exec team. Well, some like, team from the from Yugoslavia. Middle Yugoslavia, yes, 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 exactly. Yugoslavia, again, I know many Mozambicans were not quite happy with some parts of it, even though they completely participated in the film. Uh, but also Fralino imposed this model of, um, of documentary. And when I ask about the influence of Rui Guerra, they say it was mainly in this aspiration of making something beyond documentaries and, and how also this idea of docudrama became very influential in, in Mozambican cinema through this film of Rui Guerra, how that was probably the most important thing. Also because documentaries are much cheaper to film um they're faster they're easier so again you do what you can with what you have <laughs> and then when the war came the money started not to be too much there there were other issues like lack of water to develop film so there were a lot of obstacles uh uh mozambique was under um uh a boycott by the United States. So basic things didn't get to the country. So there was like water rationing. So they needed to bring water to the hospitals before bringing them to the National Film Institute. So uh, we have to be aware of all these obstacles. Um, but I do think that again, as a project, and again, not thinking, we have to, I think, to move away from this idea of water cinema to really understand the value of Mozambican cinema, and again, how it impacted Brazilians who went back to Brazil to actually do things that were central for, for Brazilian cinema, like the audiovisual law. We have the question from Silas in the yeah. um, oh. chat now. Um, hang on, where is it? Okay, can you elaborate the possible relation between Portugal and Mozambican cinema at this time? Hmm. That's a good question. Uh, I know Portugal, again, went there to film some uh, soap operas, uh, not well, again, not well received because I think Portugal still has quite a colonial uh, approach to Mozambique. Again, another thing that filmmakers complained is for instance, when they get funding from France, they, they present the project, they get the money, they do what they want. When Portugal, I don't know if it's still like this, this is like, when I talked to one of the filmmakers five years ago, maybe someone in the audience will know more than me. Portugal would always insist that a part of the crew had to be Portuguese if Portugal was giving money. Um, so that Mozambican filmmakers feel that they don't have the same freedom uh, when Portugal is involved. Of course, there's still a lot of cooperation. Uh, I think they still fund, I'm wondering if they, they funded João Ribeiro's uh, Grandma 19, which has won a lot of prizes. It's about Angola, but it's filmed in Mozambique by a Mozambican filmmaker. Um, so there are still a lot of uh, corporations. Again, also Portugal is, is not a country that has much money to its own films. So it is also hard to, to finance films from other countries. Um, I wonder, and, uh, and up to what point it might, Brazil might be involved, because I know Joel Zito Araújo, a Brazilian filmmaker, is adapting Miqueche, so I'm wondering if there are any Brazilian funds involved there. Um, but I, I mean, again, Portugal is also, I think, another obstacle. Why does France is, is more generous with giving money than Portugal? Because France has a lot more money than Portugal for film. I mean, Portuguese filmmakers struggle to be financed by their, their government, so obviously. Uh, but I, I mean, again, I also think in Mozambicans insist, and I think that's one of the things that I love about Mozambicans so much, is on their own uh, independence of these other countries, on, on making their own films, even if they have to do documentaries, even if they don't have all the means. They want to do something that is from them and independent of all these traditional colonial ties. So. Inish, can we come back to, to Rafael's question? And oh, yeah. uh, can you talk just very briefly to 
um, in, in what ways you see Mozambican uh, post-liberation filmmaking as, as similar and or different to, say, uh, the experience of Angola, Guinea-Bissau, Cabo Verde? So, um, Guinea-Bissau didn't quite, I mean, there was Flora Gomes making some films. I, I know uh, both Guinea-Bissau and, uh, but Guinea-Bissau I'm also not so familiar with, but there were some, some, some things happening, but maybe I'm not the best person to, to talk about. But again, uh, with the political turmoil that followed independence, it just became very hard to do films. And this is why Flora Gomes, his last films have not even, were filmed in Cape Verde, like Nyafala or someplace else, precisely because it just became impossible even for him to film there. In Angola, there was a project to create the, the Televisão Popular de Angola, so the film would be centered on the television. And there were very two very important filmmakers at the time, or three, well, uh, Rui Duarte de Carvalho, who is also a writer, Antonio Wallo, who is also a visual artist, um, and there was also a Jdrubal Rebelo, I could never find his films to watch, but the most important two are from Rui Duarte and Antonio Olle. Um, and uh, they did have a moratorial view of film. Uh, th th there was this attempt to create something similar to Mozambique, but I mean, when, when Angola became independent, it was already under a civil war, whereas Mozambique had more time to breed and to invest in these projects. Angola could not do it just because of the political situation. I like particularly the films of Rui Duarte. Uh, there, he, he again is also building this important idea of nation. He has a series of 10 films, three of them are lost, called uh, Angolan Present, Mumuila Time, where he contrasts the modernity of urban life in Luanda with more traditional ethnic groups like the Mumuilas. And he tries to kind of again, problematize this idea of nation by showing how different times, times like the presence and past and different ways of thinking in such a big country coexist and how, how can we create again an idea of national unity with such diversity? How can we put all these things playing together? And I, I think he's very interesting to think about. Antonio Wallace thinks he has more films about culture again, he has one on the Generation 50, which is a group of writers before independence. He has another one on Gola Ritmus, which was a very important band from the 60s and uh, 50s and 60s. Uh, and then he has one uh, where he documents the first carnival uh, that Angolans were able to celebrate after independence. So he's more focused on urban culture than Rui Duarte. And of course, you have already some Bizang and Saham al -Duhor. But again, I think one thing that really defines the films before independence and those after independence is that the films of independence were also had in mind a foreign audience that could be convinced that the cause of the MPLA and Fralimo was a just cause and these countries deserve to be independent and had the right to be independent. Whereas when independence comes, filmmakers focus to, to film, film for Angolans, film Angolans for Angolans, represent themselves to themselves. So I think that's kind of the major, major shift that happens uh, with independence, if this makes sense. And I mean, how Brazilians impacted ideas of nation in, I wonder if it's more the opposite. I want to think maybe I'm, I'm pushing things too far again, uh, uh, more thinking not so much institutionally, but on, on how these Brazilians, and I know that I just saw Vera is here on, Vera Verucha is here on the audience, how they go back. And I know Alberto uh, Graça also had educational projects with cinema that he realized were so important after being in Mozambique. So even though it's in a very small scale, I, 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 again, I also like to think that Mozambique impacted, and this is why I mentioned uh, the struggle continues, because it was a film that impacted a lot in terms of the civil rights movement, in terms of African American filmmakers, etc. So I also think that we have to think of these influences as a two way road. Uh, and that is very important uh, to decolonize, I mean, what we do in, in, in a way. Muitíssimo obrigado. 
Um, oui. It was actually great to uh, oh, sure. to have a Mozambican and Luso African film put on the map so so prominently here, also, also as a crossroads um, between Latin America, Europe, Africa, um, to 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 sort of um, yeah turn the tables a little bit, no, and and put the, the focus elsewhere. I think we we sometimes forget how. Uh, how prominent a, a place for the international solidarity network just of the global left, um, Mozambique and the Luso African countries more more generally, with thinkers such as Cabral and Mario Pinto de Andrade, who you've mentioned, uh, actually were in the 60s and, and, and 70s. And it's it's great uh, that, that um, you and folks who quoted are working to uh, kind of um, make this archive come back in, in, in a different fashion. So uh, thanks very much also on behalf of um, folks from my class. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Ines. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Thank yeah, you. It's really wonderful. Yeah. And, and thank you for not, and I'm sorry for not mentioning earlier, thank you to Susanna Amaral for your help too in coordinating. This is the first, uh, as Dylan was saying, the first talk of, of a series, um, which probably will, will um, reassume business in uh, the spring term at the beginning of February. Uh, so just stay tuned. We'll uh, post the next uh, couple of events uh, through CLACS as well as through the Hemispheric Institute and KJCC, who've also been co-sponsoring today. And the, and the Center for the Study of Africa and African um, Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're recharting the Portuguese Black Atlantic in, in this uh, constellation. Uh, so uh, stay tuned for more. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.